And one of the questions I wanted to ask you is, why is it that way? Um, so you, you, you mentioned, you know, should NGOs be building software at all? Probably not, maybe with a few exceptions, and yet they do. Um, so why do you think that so many nonprofits kind of fall into this rabbit hole and do end up building um, their own software tools, whether or not that actually makes sense or is the best use of philanthropic dollars? Yeah, I mean, I think, and of course, um, I'm sure I'm going to get uh, pilloried to, to some degree for, for the answer, and I'm gen I'm, I am drawing generalities as well. But I think, look, there are exceptions, especially around science-based um, environments where the software you might need are algorithms and models and you know, Python scripts to run models, uh, that's a whole different ball game to then building, mm -hmm. you know, field survey technology and hosting platforms and so forth. Um, they're, they're very different. And I think um, for the for the particular science oriented specific tools to to do a model for conservancy work or something like that, then obviously that makes sense. And it's probably an additional task of existing staff that they can well handle around tools that are well supported by a community, either proprietary or non. I think it's all the other things that get uh, everyone into trouble. And I would say there are a couple of reasons. One is um, the funders, donors, ourselves included, um, are often the, the, the people that drive this because we'll make statements that yeah. we want open source or we'll only fund open source because we ourselves are not well informed and many funders and donors, while well-meaning and smart, capable people, have probably never built software in their life or even come close to it and have no idea what it takes. And yet, um, or they may have dabbled in a few scripts and, and perhaps think that, uh, that that is what it's about. And so they'll write it in as a requirement or say, if, if you want our funding, this is the way you're going to uh, have to do it. And of course, <laughs> Any NGO with a decent business development office is going to say, if that's what it takes to get funding, then we'll sort of bend ourselves in a pretzel to do that. Um, I also think then NGOs see it as a fundraising strategy, to be uh, a little cynical, and and see that, um, oh, donors want innovation and technology, and let's do that, and we'll throw some things, and, and we did it on the previous project, and we can expand it, and it's helping to drive revenue and funding for us, and, and so they'll do that. And, and then I think there are a hardcore group of people who service all of this environment that, um, that, uh, that make a reasonable and decent living on providing uh, consultancy services, whether at the programming or design or other levels, um, around uh, open source. And, um, of course, everybody should be free to, to make a living. And, and if people want to pay people to do things, that's fine. But I think they also influence uh, why we get the sorts of things that we do. And the final Indeed. point I would make is that sometimes also uh, proprietary vendors or commercial vendors um, are also not good actors and often create artificially high prices, particularly around um, – uh, when they give out uh, unique distribution agreements uh, that force everybody to come to them and there's monopolistic uh, pricing power, uh, particularly in emerging economies, you are then faced with price tickets that seem uh, outrageous, and, and often they can be. And so I think in the past, in particular, commercial vendors have not always helped uh, their own cause either.